What is sigmoid scoliosis and can it be treated? Scoliosis is diagnosed through a physical examination and x-rays. And x-rays are typically determined the size of the curvature, where the curve is located, and if there's any type of twisting or rotation that's associated. And once an x-ray determines that there is a scoliosis and there's spinal rotation, the Cobb angle is typically measured. And therefore, to be a, for there to be considered a scoliosis, the Cobb angle must be 10 degrees or greater, and the, con the rotation is typically in the, into the concavity of the scoliosis. Part of diagnosing the scoliosis involves further classifying the condition based upon key variables or conditions that the patient presents with. A sigmoid scoliosis is a type of scoliosis that refers to when there's two curves in the spine that normally bend in the opposite direction. Now, when we talk about two curvatures, what we're talking about is two significant curves, meaning one bends one way and one bends the other way. We look at a double curve or an S curve is also another way of determining, determining a sigmoid scoliosis. But understand that nobody has just one curve because if you had one curve, you'd just be bent one way. Everybody has kind of compensating curves that realigns them. But we look at major curves, they're going to have, or S curves, they're going to have minimally four curves. I've seen patients with three main curves, four main curves, five main curves, and so forth. There are also three main sections of the spine, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. And scoliosis can develop in any one of these sections. And sometimes you can have more curves than just one in the exact same section. So what makes a sigmoid scoliosis different is that we're gonna have two curvatures and they bend in opposite directions. And the most common presentation we see is a thoracic scoliosis that bends to the right and a lumbar scoliosis that bends to the left. And these are typically the thoracic curvature or the right scoliosis is called a dextroscoliosis. And the left scoliosis can be called a level scoliosis. Dextro means right, level means left. Now, however, with curvature, Curves bend in the opposite directions that I just mentioned. When we have a thoracic scoliosis that bends to the left, that is considered a atypical scoliosis. Anytime we have a left bending scoliosis, that can be a red flag, meaning that could be an other underlining pathology associated with in the scoliosis development, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, however, you could have an opposite bending lumbar curve, meaning a right bending lumbar curve that just straightens up in the thoracic spine. And that's not really considered a red flag, even though it's opposite than what we normally see in the lumbar spine, which is a left lumbar. Now, the reason why the spine typically bends to the right is because innately the body will move the spine away from the heart because people's heart typically sits on the left side. So we have this right thoracic curve and that's what we tend to see. Now, left bending curves in the thoracic spine could be there could be something else occurring. And when we look at scoliosis, the majority of cases are known as idiopathic. Idiopathic scoliosis is by far the largest type. Idiopathic refers to the cause, and idiopathic means cause is unknown. These are normal healthy people that we can't really tell you if you any other reason why they're developing scoliosis, but for some reason they're developing it. The, ready, the remaining 20% are classified based on what we consider to be a, a more known cause. And one of those is called neuromuscular scoliosis, another is congenital scoliosis, and another one is degenerative scoliosis. Now, neuromuscular scoliosis is caused when a patient has a larger neuromuscular condition, something like cerebral palsy or Marfan syndrome or Ehlers Downer syndrome or neurofibromatosis. And normally these are syndromes that affect the connective tissue, the muscle tissue, or the nerve system in a negative way. And other things can be something like a coronal cry syndrome, a syrinx, or something along these lines could also be a development of a scoliosis. When somebody has this larger neuromuscular condition there, they are more likely to present with an, an opposite curvature or an atypical curvature. So when we see a right thoracic, a left thoracic scoliosis, as opposed to a right one, we look for a larger neuromuscular condition that could be occur occurring. And normally sometimes we'll send out for an MRI or some other type of finding. Congenital scoliosis is when a patient has a mouth formed vertebra in the spine that actually develops in utero. And this is when one of the bones actually develops abnormally into 
see an abnormal shape called a hemi vertebra. If we see an abnormal shaped vertebra on an X-ray, that can help explain why somebody would have a, a curve that goes to the left in the thoracic spine as opposed to the right. Degenerative scoliosis is caused by uh, abnormal age-related spinal degeneration that occurs, at, and it typically occurs in the lumbar spine. And this is normally diagnosed in older life. And these can normally be opposite related as well. We can see a right lumbar sco uh, degenerative scoliosis opposed to a left in this type of area because it's degenerative related. It's not happening during growth or development. Now, when we look at sigmoid scoliosis or S-curves where there's two significant scoliosis, these tend to be more complex to treat because it's more difficult to push the spine in two directions as opposed to one. When there's two scoli scoliosis curves, typically we're looking at which curve is going to be what I call the primary curvature. And we normally look at the one that has more rotation. We can sometimes make the decision about which one we think is larger. We can also look at which one is stiffer. We can also look at which one maybe what area is causing more pain for an adult because pain can occur in adults with scoliosis, not normally children, but typically it, when pressure is that pain, they're normally in the adult stage. If there's a level scoliosis present, meaning there's a level uh, left scoliosis in the thoracic spine, we normally look looking at for other types of issues that may be causing it. So normally we may recommend MRIs or something along those lines to see if there's any type of underlying condition. The first step when we look at this S-curve is which curve do we want to treat primarily? Now, normally we're treating both curves, but we're looking at which one we want to treat primarily. And this could, again, could be the larger, could be the stiffer, could be the area that has more rotation. But once we know the area that we want to treat, we're normally focus, focused on this area. And we classify each curve meaning the thoracic curve may be severe, the lumbar curve may be mild, or maybe it could be the thoracic curve, they're both mild or both, or both moderate. Normally, the severity of the case, though, is classified overall based upon the biggest curve. So if you have a 50-degree thoracic curve and a 10-degree lumbar curve, that would be you still be considered to have severe scoliosis, even though the lumbar curve is mild. Okay? So the severity is normally classified. Now, most uh, orthopedic surgeons will only tell you your biggest curve. They won't even talk much about the other curves if they're if they're not significant, meaning because normally the surgical indication comes off the largest curve. Now in the conservative treatment approach, we normally combine many different treatments to address all the curves. And normally we're trying to reduce the, the, the curve that we want to focus on most to a smaller size that's more under control and then focus on the second curve that we want to treat or both curves to try to reduce them simultaneously. But once we get the largest curve under control and reduced, then we can change the focus of our treatment. And once we see structural changes within the spine, this is normally done by, cons by combining many treatments, chiropractic kind of care, physical therapy, scoliospecific exercises, corrective bracing, office rehabilitation, home therapy, home exercises. We can change the focus of each of these treatments to focus either in the, uh, the thoracic curve, the lumbar curve, or trying to divide them too evenly among both. And once we have bracing, we can also change the brace to focus on different areas. We can focus more on the thoracic curve or the lumbar curve, or try to have more of a symmetrical design to try to focus on both. Last thing is that once we have all the prescriptions performed properly, and we're looking for the curve to respond appropriately, we know S-curves can be more difficult, but the great thing is that S-curves, once we get them reduced and balanced, they can be more stable. So it may be harder to reduce S-curves as significantly as we can reduce a single curve or a C-shaped curve. We can have more stability in an S-shaped curve. So even though SK curves may have less total reduction because they're more difficult, they have more stability. And since we know scoliosis is a progressive condition, as S-curves get bigger, they get more difficult to treat. And normally as S-curves bigger, they'll start progressing as one curve will become more dominant than the other. Very commonly, I'll see like they may have a balanced curve, say 40 over 40, and then if they're left untreated, the curve will continue to progress, and the lumbar curve may stay at 40, but then you see the, the lump thoracic curve go 50, 60, 70, 80. So when we can bring them back into balance, we normally continue to get the very best results. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.